steps of my key. Chapter 5, The Cost of Addiction. I destroy homes, tear families apart, take your children, and that's just a start. I'm more costly than diamonds, more costly than gold. The sorrow I bring is a sight to behold. Just try me once and I might let you go, but try me twice and I'll own your soul. When I possess you, you'll steal and you'll lie. You do what you have to do just to get high. You'll forget your morals and how you were raised. I'll be your conscience. I'll teach you my ways. I take kids from parents and parents from kids. I turn people from God and separate from friends. I'll take everything from you, your looks and your pride. I'll be with you always right by your side. I'll take and I'll take till you have nothing more to give. When I'm finished with you, you'll be lucky to live. If you try me, be warned, this is no game. If given the chance, I'll drive you insane. I'll ravish your body. I'll control your mind. I'll own you completely. Your soul will be mine. The nightmares I'll give you while lying in bed. The voices you'll hear from inside your head. The sweats, the shakes, the visions you'll see. I want you to know these are all gifts from me. But then it's too late. And you'll know in your heart that you are mine and we shall not part. You'll regret that you tried me. They always do. But you came to me, not I to you. You knew this would happen. Many times you were told, but you challenged my power and you chose to be bold. You could have said no and just walked away. If you could live that day over now, what would you say? I'll be your master. You will be my slave. I'll even go with you when you go to your grave. Now that you have met me, what will you do? Will you try me or not? It's all up to you. I can bring you more misery than words can tell. Come, take my hand. Let me lead you to hell. Wow, this poem has various versions and is commonly attributed to a few different people, but regardless of the author, the points are very clear that addiction brings destruction. And again, I'm reading from my book, Help, I'm Addicted, Controlling the Cravings that Control You. And we are in chapter five. And I want to remind the listeners that, you know, clearly a destructive lifestyle devoid of God can be hell on earth. Evenly, even seemingly innocent addictions can wreak havoc on our health and our family. The effect that this has on our attitudes um, and our, our demeanor is very negative. First Peter actually says, 2.11, urges us to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. But I don't want to leave you with condemnation. Conviction, yes, but condemnation, no. And when I challenge people in this area, I often ask them, are you genuinely sorry and repentant? Or are you just sorry that your reputation and life are on the verge of being ruined? The difference between sorrow and repentance is vital because many confuse the two. It's possible to be sorry about the consequences of addiction, but not truly repentant. This is why many return to their former state. They rationalize and make excuses for addiction. By excusing our actions, we deny responsibility. Ironically, as I was writing this chapter, a friend of mine keeps blaming his alcoholism on his spouse. He will die soon if he continues down this very destructive path. This is why pride is so dangerous. A repentant person, person who's repented, turns from sin. Anger, for example, subsides, not remains. Those who are repentant accept full responsibility for their actions without blame, resentment, or bitterness. When repentance is genuine, we want to be reconciled with those we've injured. We seek forgiveness without conditions and stipulations. We take full, not partial, responsibility for our actions. We don't blame this or that. There can be no buts when repentance is genuine. I am sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Are often, although not always, healing words and signs of repentance. If this is not occurring, repentance has not taken place. Again, I'm not minimizing the deep pain, emotional toll, and spiritual struggle that addiction brings. But I do want to remind you that God makes provision for all of our needs, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And as I stated earlier, we must surrender to Him. Many are already surrendered, but to the wrong thing. So here's a nugget of hope. Overcoming addiction has a great deal to do with falling forward, okay? Fall forward, or you could say fell forward. This is not a license to sin, but it is an encouragement to those who keep falling to get back up and fight again. 
get up. Get up and fight again. God uses our failures to remind us of our need for him. Once we look to him for guidance, strongholds begin to lose their power. Think about that. Once we begin to seek God, the stronghold actually begins to lose its power, lose its influence because you're seeking something that is greater. And the filling of the Holy Spirit pushes out a lot of these strongholds. The allurement of sin begins to weaken its grip. Some strongholds don't immediately crumble. They come down one brick at a time. I talked about that in the previous chapter. Uh, sometimes we pray and things don't instantly go away. Sometimes we have to fight them one brick at a time. So get out the 15-pound sledgehammer and go to work. Pray, fast, apply the word, worship, and trust in God. This is how we fight our battles. Years ago, seemingly out of nowhere, a fiery dart was shot at me. An intense desire to drink alcohol again came over me. I felt helpless, almost if I were a puppet in the hands of a cruel master. This is a demonic temptation. But by God's grace, I called on him, called on God, and began to worship him. As I, soon as I made that decision, the craving began to diminish. Again, did not vanish necessarily, but it did diminish. They didn't super, I'm sorry, they didn't disappear right away, but the grip, that grip it has, has on you will begin to loosen. You know, think of this tight grip and, and one finger at a time. And that's why sometimes it's so strong, you can't, it's hard to let go, but just keep seeking God, keep worshiping, keep praying. And, and one finger at a time, that grip will eventually um, um, be removed. The Bible says it resists the devil and he will flee. He sometimes doesn't flee within the first five seconds though. The idol of addiction needs to be crushed, not coddled. I vividly remember one young woman who was addicted to painkillers. Her use eventually led to harder drugs and ultimately led to a deadly overdose that sent shockwaves through our congregation. As I spoke at the memorial service, I saw hundreds of broken lives and deep bondage. Many who were attending were high. Through their pain, which was visible on their faces, I could tell that it was a deeper issue. And their pain was real, of course, but we can still offer hope and encouragement, especially to those people who are dealing with this type of pain. And we, we, we point them to the cross. We point them to the Savior. That's the only hope to overcoming, truly overcoming addiction. I also recall another time when a young man lost visitation rights to see his young daughter. His use, his use, I'm sorry, his use of oxycotton, or I guess you could say oxycodone, is the, you know, there's a name brand and there's a, 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 a generic and things like that. The bottom line is his use of oxy had finally taken its toll. It promised pleasure, but brought regret and imprisonment. I've counseled many who admitted that alcohol or substance abuse ruined their marriage and drove their children further away from God, yet they fell to truly want to change. God can pull you out of the deepest pit and the lowest point of despair as well. I know he can. The greater the pain, the more we appreciate our Redeemer. Think about that. The greater the pain, the deeper the pit, the more love you're going to have for Christ often when he pulls you out. Remember Luke 7, 47, those who have been forgiven much, love much. Even if you're at, you're at your absolute lowest point, there is always hope. If you're hearing this and you're breathing, there is hope. God can pull you out of the pit, but you have to, you have to turn everything over to him, repent, fully surrender. And of course, you know, make some lifestyle changes. Addiction is Satan's tool to kill, steal, and destroy. The enemy doesn't show a person the pain, anguish, and years of regret that addiction brings, rather he deceives them with the temporary enjoyment. They fall back into shame, back into depression, and the cycle of bondage often continues. So what happens is they, you know, they, they fell, they fall, and then they get depressed, and then they fall back again, there's shame, there's guilt, what's the use, and they just keep falling back and back, and they never break out of the cycle. We must also have to be very careful when it comes to pain management. Countless people become addicted to drugs as a result of medicating their pain. I estimate that nearly 30% of the people I pray with about addiction got hooked this way. My advice is to use short-term and minimal dosages that you, that, you know, if you must go that route, but eventually wean off. A wise man once said, when faced with temptation, play the whole tape in your mind. In other words, don't focus on the temporary pleasure. Look at where it will lead. Private sin will eventually become public disgrace. A commentary on Genesis brings this point home. Esau acted on impulse, satisfying his immediate desires without pausing to consider the long-range consequences of what he was about to do. 
When we see something we want, our first impulse is to get it. We might feel such great pressure in this one area that nothing else seems to matter and we lose our perspective. Getting through that short, pressure-filled moment is often the most difficult part of overcoming temptation. The cost of addiction. Addiction hinders our relationship with God. Again, let me repeat that. It hinders our relationship with God. I've never met a person who felt close to God while continuing in an addiction they know to be wrong, whether it's gluttony, you know, food, alcohol, um, oxy, uh, even caffeine, nicotine. If God is convicting them to stop and they don't, it's, it's hard to, to find that, that peace and passion because we're in disobedience. Acts 3.19 says that repentance leads to times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. So take that step today and experience refreshment and joy again. Addiction also can turn into idolatry, which is the opposite of worship. Romans 1.25 speaks of idolaters who exchange the truth about God for a lie by worshiping and serving created things rather than the creator. Addiction damages our relationship with our spouse, children, family, and friends. We feed our addiction versus investing time with those we love. How many boys want their father to play catch? How many girls want daddy time? Kids need our attention. We are competing with a society that is always busy but rarely doing anything noteworthy. This applies to smartphones and social media as well. They are time zappers. Moreover, ministry is stifled and spiritual growth minimized when addiction prevails. Addiction, next point here, also fuels irritability and anger. Did you know that? If you're dealing with irritability and anger, check your addictions. We snap more easily when we're under pressure. We can also, it also leads to rude and manipulative behavior. Addiction controls, influence, and provokes anger. Alcohol often fuels angry temper tantrums and explosive outbursts. So does really any drug. It fuels those things. So the very thing you're trying to work on, you keep fueling it. Addiction to caffeine often does the same. It's a powerful stimulant that feeds anger, irritability, and a quick temper. Being hot-headed. Even the diagnostic, it's called the, actually the uh, DSMMD, but it's a Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders. It lists caffeine-related disorders such as caffeine intoxication, caffeine-induced anxiety disorder, and caffeine-induced sleep disorder. All can lead to angry outbursts and extreme irritability and poor health because sleep being sleep-deprived is not good. Again, don't rationalize and make excuses for addiction. By excusing addictions, we deny responsibility. Take responsibility and make the needed changes. Addiction leads to financial difficulty. Overspending and poor choices also feed the addiction and vice versa. It's difficult to maintain employment when one is addicted. And even those who remain employed can never seem to get it together. Uh, of course, I'm talking about more severe addictions. They can lead to financial difficulty. Look, it affects just about every single area of life. Also, addiction hinders God's blessings. God will not fully bless those living in disobedience. When sin runs its course, it's often it often hurts careers, ministries, health, and everything that God has blessed us with. It takes years to build. It can take seconds to destroy. But thank God for God's hope and, and mercy, uh, hope and mercy and grace through God. Turn to him today. Don't keep confusing his patience with his approval. At the heart of addiction is idolatry, as I said earlier. Therefore, we need heart surgery to remove the idol that has taken up residency in our heart. Psychologists are familiar with the term cognitive dissidence, which defines the battle inside a person who believes one way yet acts another. But God calls addiction sin, and he uses conviction to bring us in line with his truth. Although many wonderful godly counsel, counselors anchor their counsel in the word of God, scores of others offer advice contrary to scripture. So be very careful where you're getting your advice. For example, psychology says, oh, the heart is good. But scripture say the heart is deceitful. Psychology says you just need to unlock your inner strength. Scripture says willpower is not enough. Psychology says don't lay a guilt trip on the addict, uh, but the Bible says conviction is good. Psychology says it's not really your fault. 
The Bible says, confess your sins and repent. It is your fault. Psychology says therapy is the answer. Although it may help, the Bible says that Christ is the answer. And so when we say things like, you know, don't lay a guilt trip on me, it might make you feel better, but it's not biblical and it will not help. The guilt, fear, and conviction we feel are used by God to draw us to repentance and to um, fully, fully surrender our lives to him. It, it, this is completely appropriate to help people. Professional counselors, for example, can be wonderful resources if they get to the root of the problem and don't write off shame and guilt. Now, again, we don't want a person to live with shame and guilt. We want them to dump shame and guilt at the foot of the cross and then be able to move forward. When we hurt, we should turn to God, not try to excuse behavior. If those who offer counsel minimize conviction, they may actually be enabling the person and hindering the work that God may be doing in their heart. Now, I'm not suggesting we refrain from comforting people, but comfort should not replace conviction. As stated, as stated at the beginning of this book, the first step towards freedom is recognizing our need for a Savior and turning to Him. Conviction often points us in his direction. Don't allow guilt and shame to continue ruining your life. Proverbs 13, 15 says that the way of the transgressor is hard. But 1 John 1, 9 offers hope. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Breaking free. Now that we have covered the cost of addiction, here are a few key takeaways to help you start taking steps in the right direction. Some of this is a recap of what we've discussed uh, thus far. Nevertheless, it will be helpful. Number one, repentance must take place. And again, I realize I'm really using this word repentance a lot, but I would rather talk too much about it than too little. Sadly, many are confused about repentance and most pulpits avoid the word altogether. Some even say that repentance is self-improvement or a call to fulfill our natural potential. When we repent, we do improve and our God-given potential becomes more apparent. But repentance is not about self-improvement. It's about renouncing sin and turning from it. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of ac action. Brokenness, genuine sorrow over sin, and humility are all marks of sincere repentance. Lasting hope and joy are also byproducts of a right relationship with God, beginning with repentance. When confronted, many will say that they are sorry, but deep, deep down, they want to enjoy sin. J.C. Ryle hits the nail on the head. He said, holiness will cost a man his sins. He must be willing to give up every habit and every practice that is wrong in God's sight. There must be no separate truce with any special sin which he loves. There's always a link between genuine change and sincere repentance. Did you catch up? There's always a link between those two. Next, ask God for help. I know that seems simple, but it's, it's so important. We must seek to identify the middle ground between our responsibility and God's role in changing us. If the pendulum swings too much in the grace direction, obedience will suffer. Some may, even, uh, some may not agree with the statement, but the Bible is filled with passages dealing with obedience. Now, if it goes in the obedience direction too much, and then it's all about obedience and works, and it can turn into legalism, and you become rigid, you lose your, 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 the softness of the spirit, the love, and the joy. So you, you do have to um, err on the side of grace, but also realize that obedience is so important. For example, check out James 1.22. It says, be doers of the word, which is obedience, and not hearers only, or you will deceive yourself. Obedience is always a hallmark of faith. First John 2 talks about, um, verses 3 through 4 says, we know him. Uh, those who say they know him and do not keep his commandments are a liar. Okay, that's obedience. The word keep means to keep watchful care of. And I could give you so many other scriptures about you know, do, make no provision for the flesh. Let this mind be in you. Turn from this. Put on the whole armor of God. Obedience is, is so important. In the same way that a ship's captain is committed to keep his course to reach his destination, the sincerity of our commitment to Christ can be measured by how well we follow the scriptural course via obedience. And as I often say, sanct uh, sanctification is God's job, correct? But obedience is ours. On the other hand, if the pendulum swings too much in the obedience direction, like I just said, 
One may become a rule-following legalist who never experiences God's wonderful grace. Legalism can be defined as a self-righteous attitude that rates spirituality by how well a person follows rules. Christ plus something equals morality. That's not good. Legalism prevents change because it hardens the heart. The legalist often justifies their behavior because they are right, at least in their own eyes. Be careful because pride is at the root of all sin. Proud people often don't change until they are broken and humble. Brokenness, humility, and full surrender provide fertile ground for change. We have responsibilities, yet we are totally dependent upon God. We must do our part, but we cannot do His. Again, it is God who makes us stand firm in Christ. Check out 2 Corinthians 1.21. Seek Him. And then again, we've talked about this before. The next point here, avoid excuses and avoid the victim mentality. You know the victim. Oh, I'm just a victim. It's not my fault. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. When we fail to take responsibility for our actions, the endless cycle of blame, anger, and unforgiveness often continue. Those enslaved by blame and unforgiveness are truly imprisoned, and they and the walls they built to protect them may eventually imprison them. These destructive forces prohibit change. By excusing our actions, we deny responsibility. Those who continue with harmful addictions, for example, often excuse their actions and even justify them. Don't blame your parents, your culture, your race, your spouse, or the government. Take responsibility now, even if it hurts. As a matter of fact, it will hurt. And then the final point, never underestimate the seriousness of sin. Be crystal clear on this issue. Sin destroys. Little sins or little vices that we enjoy eventually grow and become strong influence, uh, influences. Addiction has a life cycle. It either grows or withers depending on whether you feed or starve it. James 1 talks about uh, the destructive course of sin in verses 14, 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Don't blame God. Don't blame others. And by that, that desire then begins to entice you. Then... If this desire is conceived and you keep feeding on it, it gives birth to sin. And if it's unrepentant and you just keep feeding it, sin, fully grown, brings forth death. So don't blame the devil. The devil didn't make you do it. He can influence, he can harass, but he can't make us do anything. We are led away by our own desires. He simply presents the bait. Jesus came to give life. Are you experiencing the abundant life that Christ spoke of? Think about that. Are you are you truly experiencing the abundant life that Christ spoke of? Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. If not, I would encourage you to really look at your faith and see if full surrender has taken place. There is a negative cost to addiction, but the cost of following Christ brings tremendous hope and peace, a huge positive. We all pay a price for following something or someone, correct? Well, then make the choice today to follow Christ, despite the cost, because the cost will always, the cost of following him um, is, 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 it doesn't even compare to the cost of giving into sin. Take time now, read Luke chapter 14 about truly counting the cost. And when you count the cost, you're basically recognizing I might not be a friend of the world anymore. Uh, some people, friends might not want to hang around with me. I'm going to look different. I'm going to act different. But the filling and the fullness of the spirit is going to come into my heart and my life like never before. It's incredible. We can't rule out the possibility of a spiritual attack. All right, last section here. A quick word about demonic activity. Just a quick word about this. I want to talk about this more in the future. We can't rule out the possibility of a spiritual attack when it comes to addiction and and drawing us back into addiction. Throughout the New Testament, demonic activity caused mental anguish. When a person takes powerful drugs, That may only increase the problem and could even open the door to further demonic activity. Did you know that the word pharmacy comes from a a Greek word, pharmakia? It means to administer drugs, and it has spiritual ramifications. In the Bible, it's often tied to the practice of magic and sorcery. But before seeking to deal with the spirit of division, humble yourself. Before blaming a spirit of lust, flee from it. You don't have to cast out a spirit of drunkenness you can abstain. So see, it's, it's, it's not the spirit making me do these things. It could be a spiritual battle influencing me, but ultimately the choice 
as a believer is up to you whether you cave in or not. Now, I'm not minimizing demonic activity. In some cases, a person may need deliverance. I've seen my share. But the amount of demonic influence that comes into our lives often depends on how far we open the door. It's no surprise that a friend, um, that the friend who I mentioned caught in alcoholism earlier also enjoyed dark, destructive, gothic music. He feeds the demons he is trying to run from. How about you? Are you feeding what you should be fleeing? Empowering you should be, I'm sorry, empowering what you should be quenching. So I'm going to say that again. Are you feeding what you should be fleeing? And are you empowering what you should be actually quenching? How do you know if an attack is demonic? Well, take it to God in prayer and fast. And I'm going to get to that, uh, to appendix number two later in the book. I'll, I'll go through that. And there's five points in that appendix that could play a role to see if something is a demonic attack. Ask for wisdom and ask for deliverance if necessary. Have you opened any obvious doors, such as messing around with palm reading, tarot cards, Ouija boards, or other occultic things, you know, dream catchers and uh, crystals? And I mean, the list is, is just is, is fairly long. What about alcohol and drugs? Are you opening yourself up to even marijuana? It's a gateway to the spiritual realm, and it will open the door to demonic influences in your life. Is there a family history of occult practices and drug use and, and getting involved in um, uh, uh, false religions and worshiping false gods and things that are unrepentant? Um, have those strong in the faith pray for you regularly? I can't say this enough. That's why we have prayer time at our church a couple times a day on Sundays. Have people strong in the faith, pray for you. And they can sometimes discern what's going on. They can pray specifically for you. And it's a biblical course of action to help overcome addiction. Now, remember, some strongholds must be pulled down one brick at a time. Don't give up. Look up. Don't get discouraged. Keep fighting. Saturate your mind in the word and pray and worship throughout the day. And eventually, that stronghold will break because the word of God says, resist the devil and he will flee.